half of it, but um, it's not all based on just my efforts. So it's kind of like the, um, and I forget who said it, but you know, instead of doing a hundred percent of my own efforts, I'm getting in this scenario, 50%, but you know, it's kind of better to do 1% of a hundred people's efforts versus a hundred percent of your own. So um, that's kind of something that I like to think of. I mean, I don't have a hundred people, but um, you know, I split deals with a lot of people. So um, we had, I think on the wholesale side, we did like maybe six deals last month, but then I had a flip that closed and then I had another rental that I was doing a lease option uh, or I had a seller finance me on and I had done a lease option with somebody, made some money on that, got rid of them because they weren't paying. And then I had a renter in there for the last couple of years. But um, there's an investor that was looking for some properties and they were paying 10% or they were looking for to pay um, uh, or they were looking for a 10% gross uh, um, income on their property. So um, I had a rental that was uh, bringing in some money in an area that they're interested in. So um, I sold that one as well um, since I had some equity in that from paying down that from having the tenants pay down the note for me. So um, that one was pretty interesting because um, they're paying 900 a month rent on that. So the buyer would only pay 90,000. And I asked them if they, if I got it up to a thousand, if they would pay a um, hundred thousand and they said, yes. So um, what I did was I paid the tenant uh, $1,200 a hundred dollars for each additional month. That way they could keep paying the same amount. So me paying the tenant the 1200 got me an extra 10 grand on, uh, on that sales price. So. Wonderful. Wonderful. What's your favorite strategy? What's your favorite strategy? What's your, your go-to strategy? Or do you use a lot of different strategies? Um, I use a lot of different ones. Um, it just really depends on what I'm trying to do with it. Um, so the properties that I like to hold, I like to hold by having the seller finance it. Um, you know, I like to invest my money. So whenever I do that, I always finance it back out to somebody. So, um, you know, I usually make money up front. So, you know, I, I think I've only had one deal where I had a down payment on it. And I think I put 2000 down on that one. Is that that rental that I just sold? Um, all my other ones, uh, including my Airbnb that I've got at the lake. Um, you know, I've put zero down on all of them. And then um, usually I finance them back out and I'll, I'll make, you know, five to 10 grand on them. So I make money up front and then I make, you know, anywhere from 300 to, I think I've got a, a triplex where I make almost a thousand dollars a month cash flow on that. So, you know, I make that. And then, um, you know, depending on how I'm, how I'm selling it back off, if it's a lease option, then I'll make money on the back end. If it's an owner finance, then I'll just make cash flow until it's paid off. Tell, um, tell us about the Airbnb. I am fascinated by that. You have a property that's totally marketed through Airbnb. Airbnb. Yeah. So that's the one I was talking to you about before when I was down there. And okay. um, so, yeah, I, um, I got that one in October and I had been trying to get that property since June of last year. And um I thought they were going to sell it to me uh, last summer and they wouldn't, you know, they, they quit taking my calls. So I happened to be down there and noticed they still had it in October. And so I reached back out to them from my girlfriend's phone number so that it was a different phone number and was able to go meet with them and chat. And then, you know, basically I kind of offered the same thing to them again. It was basically zero down. I paid, you know, $1,200 a month. Um, you know, and I was trying to get it for five years, they wouldn't go for that, but, Anyways, um, you know, while we were there, they were, before I left town, they said that they um, weren't interested in the deal. And I was like, wait, wait, hold on a minute. I still got to get pictures of the house. Meet me over there because uh, I wasn't going to let this one go away again. So I, I met them over there. And then so the thing with these people is they're they're getting older and they're um, they had a lot of equity in the property. I bought it for 220 and I think they would write around 100 on it. Um, so they were wanting to take that equity out. Um, just, you know, they wanted to be able to do something with it before, you know, they passed away because they didn't know how much longer they may be around. Um, you know, so their thing was, well, you know, if we wanted to go on a cruise or something and I said, well, Hey, I got these cruises, you can go anywhere you want. I've got two of them. 
Um, you know, I'll give you one of them. And they're like, well, yeah, that might, that might work. And then it was like, you know, cause I kept trying to say down payment and I was like, not wanting to put any money down. I was like, you know, I got to make repairs. I got to update it. I got to furnish it. I got to, you know, I got to do all these things. So, um, you know, they're like, well, let me think about it, you know, and then they were still trying to get out of it. And I just kept trying to figure out a new way of like, how do I get around this thing? So, um, the way that I ended up structuring it to get them to be okay with it is I still gave them, Oh, they were also wanting interest. They're like, well, maybe if we do interest. So I didn't want to do interest again. Um, so the way that we ended up structuring it was it was still zero down. Um, their, their mortgage payment is a thousand dollars a month on it. So I'm paying 1200. So they get 200 a month cash flow. Um, but essentially I said, Hey, look, that $200 will be like a flat fee interest that you're getting. You know, so it's not, I mean, it's kind of affecting me a little bit, but it's not because I still get a hundred or I still get a thousand dollars that goes towards my principal. So even though they're, that thousand is technically going to their mortgage, they're not seeing it. They're only seeing $200 a month each month, but I'm getting a thousand each month going towards my principal. So, um, but they were okay with that. You know, that 200 was their insurance or I mean their interest. Um, and then- insurance. James yes. is uh, is the the hundred, who's getting the principal pay down? You or the, the seller? Who's getting the what? The principal pay down. I am getting the principal pay down. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So their principal is moving, but it's not my mine's moving much faster than theirs because they have interest on their on their loan. So um, yeah, I'm getting the better part of that deal. Um, so yeah, but then the way I got around the um, the down payment is I said, okay, look, instead of me giving you money up front, every 13th month, I will give you $5,000, which allows me 12 full months to be able to generate income on that property in order to be, make a payment. So again, that, that 5,000 will go towards the principal. So everything except for that 200 monthly, I go towards principal. Um, and I can pay as much extra as I want. So my thought was, you know, I'm going to Airbnb it. It's going to be a lake house for me and my family as well. But I'm going to have the Airbnb um, make sure that it pays for my fun and allows me to make money. So, you know, right now I've just been airbnb it and just trying to rent it out as much as I can this summer uh, to be able to generate as much income for these three years that I have uh, so that, you know, those people that are renting it from me are paying down that for me. And then on the back end, if I need to refinance it or cash it out, I can do so. So do you, do you project that you'll have this property free and clear in a certain amount of years? Um, so within the three years, if I just rent it out, I should be able to pay down close to 100000 from just my, my rent that I'm bringing in. That's without me pulling out any money out of my pocket. Okay. Beautiful. Yeah. What's your occupancy? How, what's your success with Airbnb? What's your occupancy rate? Are you are you getting filled every weekend or weekdays? And yeah, so um, er, just about every weekend through the summer has been filled. And so, can I ask? Can, what do you get on a weekend in that house uh, per night or whatever? So because it because I was just getting started, like my rates were a little bit lower, but still I was getting three hundred dollars a night. Whoa. So, okay. So that's uh, four weeks, six hundred bucks a weekend. Uh, 2400 $2, a month average or something like that? Well, so um, I have a three night minimum, which I've been, so I, I, the, as I've gotten through this, this summer more and more, like we've started kind of changing it. So um, the last couple people that have booked to fill in space, um, they're paying $400 a night and, um, and it's a four night minimum now. So going into next year, I'm going to have it as a four night minimum and I'll have my rates higher with now that I'll have more reviews and all that stuff. So um, I also have a doc. Um, so I'm going to start um, offering that as additional. Um, I've got one person that's doing it. So I'm charging them $25 a night extra for them to be able to use my slip, which my neighbor has a slip they're not using. So all I got to do is move my boat over. <laughs> so. Uh, very nice. I'll, I'll probably increase that too because that's, I think the marina around the corner is like almost a hundred bucks a night. So, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm working on trying to figure out additional add ons to increase the, uh, you know, nightly amount. So, 
Do you see, do you have a purchase option on that house? Yeah. So, um, so I did a lease, um, a rent own on that um, because they have a mortgage on it. Um, so yeah, my my price was two twenty, and then again, the way that I have it structured is a thousand is going towards the principal each month. So as long as I make all my payments, fulfill my obligation through the rent, then you know whatever the balance will be at the end of it, um, you know I can cash it out or refi it. Okay. And then as as Pete Fortunato says, you've got the deal after the deal, which mm -hmm. is uh, you know you can come back in three years and and make a new deal with them, you know, and say, hey, Mr. Seller you know, I've look at my track record of payments to you. How about we do this? And uh, yes, so then you so can I, do it again. I even added a, a clause in my contract because if the market crashes, because I don't know what it's going to do in three years, that if it has dropped, and I'm trying to remember what the numbers were, but I think if it had dropped 40,000 or more, um, that I was able to extend it for another year at minimum. Um, you know, that way, because then, you know, then I don't have as much equity as I was needing in the first place. So, uh, I've got some little clauses in there that'll help if, if something does happen, but, um, yeah, my goal is just keep renting it out as much as I can. And then, um, um, you know, letting the renters pay down the mortgage for me. Okay. Question. Um, so it sounds like not only are you getting the pay down, uh, but you're also getting a, it sounded close to a thousand a month profit. Um, I'm making more, like this month, I think I'm making profit is almost four grand. Wow. And so I love this whole idea of using Airbnb and everything. Quick question. My legal mind was going, did you open escrow or get a quit claim or anything like that? Uh, God forbid these owners are deceased and, this property goes into probate and you have problems with the family or something. What's your protection to exercise the option? So I actually don't have that. Um, I, this uh, last week I was actually um, working with my attorney to get some stuff drawn up for all that um, along with an additional contract for, um, for them to sign outside of Airbnb for while they're there in case they do damages or get hurt or something because we're right by a big resort and um, a really popular bar there. And, you know, so I've had a lot of damage already to my house just in the time because people are going there getting drunk and just having fun, which I'm okay with that. I get it. But I mean, and they've paid me every single time. It's more of a little, ha more of a hassle, but I've got some additional things I'm working with her to make sure that uh, outside of the Airbnb part, I'm just, I'm protected on the, on the purchase part of it having, you know, we're going to have their uh, kids and, and uh, whatnot sign off on the sale and all that stuff too. So do you have any additional insurance, James, personal or through Airbnb on this transaction? On this so deal? Airbnb has insurance. Um, and I think it's up to a million, but yeah, I do have an additional um, insurance that, and I can't remember what the company's called, but it only insures for the time that the people are there. You know, so instead of you paying insurance for the entire month, you pay insurance for the days that it's rented and it links with your Airbnb account. So it knows when the actual rental days are. Is this your first Airbnb type deal or you've done this before? No. So I have a triplex that I was testing it out on um, and I had a lot of good luck with it through, um, uh, through the Christmas you know, time and through New Year's and stuff. And then for whatever reason, the site keeps like kicking my property off as it, and, and basically making my, my days not active. So I, I, I need to get with them to see why it's doing that. But so, I, I mean, I had had probably 10 renters um, before I got this one, which I was testing it out on. So I like the idea. I just don't know that I like it because that's more of a um, commercial area. It's like on a main street a lot of commercial buildings. Mine's just a triplex right there. Um, so I'm sure if I was in more of a neighborhood, it would have better, better um, success because I was renting it real, real low, but still I was making, you know, 900 a month on that one unit. Beautiful. Um, so, but yeah, I definitely want to do some more at the lake. There's another one that's right at the end of my street that I'm looking at possibly doing it on. Um, that guy's been trying to sell for a long time. It doesn't have lake access, but um, it's still right by there. And on that one, I would set it up that it would be more like a frat house. It would just have beds 
nothing nothing great in it if they damage it they damage it because i know the people that own the bar around the corner i was telling you about and they own like 13 of them like right basically between the resorts and the uh, bar and theirs are just i mean they they get trashed all the time but um I mean, they're, they're, they have, theirs are big houses, but they're, they're renting theirs out for like a thousand to fourteen hundred dollars a night. Whoa. But it's all directed back to the bar, you know? So they're getting it from there and they'll do like bachelor parties and, you know, uh, you know, whatever. Um, but they'll have these huge groups and it's just like bunk beds in the property, just tons of bunk beds. The more people they can sleep, the better. And then they drive them all right back to the bar. It's really cool how they have it set up. Wow. I, I love this idea of tying in the lease purchase with Airbnb. Uh, what about the, um, is there an off season for you on these properties during the fall and winter or, or where the property sits empty or? So because I haven't really done it through the winter yet, because oh. the beginning of the year I was working on getting it, uh, getting it furnished and then we were doing some work over there and stuff. But um, I spoke to a lady that, that manages a lot of them over there and she said that the winters are still pretty good. So she said, make sure, you know, cause I've got two fireplaces in my place, then one upstairs and downstairs. Um, and then I'm going to get a hot tub here when it starts getting more towards the fall. And she said, if you could do, do certain type romantic packages or maybe offer, offer a bo offer a bottle of wine. Uh, things like that where people could come down and, you know, they've got a hot tub when it's, when it's cold out and then they've got the fireplaces and stuff like that, that she can, she usually can get quite a bit of people through the winter months into her properties as well. So that's my goal. I, I'll have a lot of reviews for the, for the summer and then that should set me up better for the winter. Do you see this as a regular strategy, something you're going to just do repeatedly, uh, uh, tying in? Uh, properties that you can control for very little money option or owner finance or subject to and then convert it to an Airbnb. Um, yes, I, I definitely want to try to do some more at this lake or just other popular destinations. Um, so I also know somebody who does a lot of these, but he, instead of him, him doing lease options, he even does them just through rentals. So he'll, he'll get in contact with the actual owner and just say, Hey, you know, look, you know, um, I work for a company and what we do is we house, um, uh, and I forget the word he uses, but he basically he, he houses um, short term, you know, people who are in town for, for a short period of time for business uh, travels and, and, you know, he'll basically, he'll even pay him more per month. Uh, you know, he lets them know that, hey, your house is going to be professionally cleaned each week after each guest. You know, these people have less wear and tear on the properties because they're there for a short period of time. Um, you know, he, he even does upgrades to the properties, things like that. And uh, basically, he, he just provides his own contract to them. It's a normal contract, but more or less the verbiage just allows for him to sublease it back out. Uh, or it's not even sublease because he's not technically renting it to them, but it still allows uh, for him to have guests there. Um, and it structures it around how he does it, but, um, but then he's just paying a deposit and then, uh, and then renting it out from the, from the landlord, but then he'll just Airbnb those. So. Wow. I love, yeah. I love, I love this idea. Uh, on yeah. it. But it has to be, I guess the kicker is it's gotta be a desirable property, uh, a vacation area near a golf course, the beach, near the ski area the, or something like that. Right. Yeah, I mean, at least for me, that's how I see it, the best the best place to do it. Um, I mean, I've got some other friends that I'd have around here um, that have them more just in you know downtown Kansas City, and and they do pretty well on theirs too. But they, you know, they've bought their properties cash or financing, and you know, they're three hundred thousand dollar homes, and you know, they're I mean, they're still making you know a few grand a month on them, but um, to me. I just would rather, so like my goal is to try to get more of these, but I want to do them in other states uh, oh, places, in places where I want to go. So then, you know, if I want to go visit those, I already have a place set up there and I can, you know, Airbnb it when I'm not there. And then yeah, you too, James. Uh, that's, that's something I like to do as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. So, so well, yeah, I sure, I sure like the concept of buying whiskey by the barrel and selling it by the dram. That's, uh, 
that's the yeah. whole concept of Airbnb. It is, and, yes. And I like your idea of being able to control the property and then Airbnb it without having to actually buy it. And the, the way that you did it uh, to structure the financial end of things is brilliant. Thanks. Yeah, it, it, it's a very exciting idea. Now, if you want to do it in, a, let's say you get a place uh, uh, in Florida or Southern California or Hawaii, okay, because you always want to own a little place in Maui and everything. Yeah. How are you going to manage it, though? Management is always on a place that has a high turnover like this. Isn't management an issue? Um, it could be, you know, so, um, I mean, you definitely want to have, um, you know, a handyman person that's around. Um, so I opted out not to do the person that I was telling you about a minute ago that manages a lot of them down there because her way, which this is even a brilliant thing to do too, because I've noticed a lot of these, um, Airbnb managers, they take anywhere from 40 to 50% of the profit to manage them. And instead of doing like a normal rental, you know, where you get maybe eight, 10%, they're taking, you know, 40 to 50%. Um, so there's a lot more, but they're marketing it. They're, you know, making sure the repairs are done, the turnover is done. Uh, the one lady, she even provides the linens um, for the people. Um, and she'll, she'll do like paper plates and, uh, and, and stuff like that. But um, so those are things that her costs that she's providing. Uh, which I think is just a way of her saying, hey, look, I'm providing more. Uh, but to me, it wasn't worth 40 or 50%. So I ended up just finding, um, you know, a good handyman. He actually lives, he's the one that has the house that I might try to buy. Um, but he, uh, so he, anytime there's a repair or damage over there, I get him over there. He just lives around the corner. And then I have a girl that I found that doesn't live too far. Um, and she has a small little cleaning company and then I just, you know, pay her to go over there and clean. So I have a, a wide, so I'm trying to make that house as a smart house as much as I can. So I've got like a digital, um, um, Wi-Fi thermostat so that I can pro, you know, everything that I need to do, I can do from my phone. I can turn it down or turn yeah. it up or, or whatever. And then I've also got a Wi-Fi lock on the front so I can see who's coming and going when they check in, when they check out. Um, if I need to uh, um, add a new code. Yep. Is any, uh, can I interrupt? Uh, just, you, you really piqued my, this is called a wise camera. I think I've mentioned it to you guys. W Y Z E $19 and 95 cents, no maintenance fees. You can put them around the house so you can, you can't invade people's privacy, be careful, but you can monitor who's coming and going and things like that. And uh, you can use your, you can monitor it on your iPhone. You, it has a fire alert, a motion detector, uh, wyze.com. Check this out, guys. I, I have these at all my houses now. Um, they're, they're really good. Sorry to interrupt you there, James. Oh, but you're fine. Uh, but yeah, so the door locks, you know, I mean, I can um, change codes from my phone. I can add new codes. I can unlock it, you know, lock it, whatever I need to do all for my phone because I'm three hours away from there. So I'm not trying to go run out there every time I need to. But um, but yeah, I mean, it's just it's just a matter of finding the right person. I mean, I had to go out there a couple of times. Moving forward, I, I would probably be able to go out there, set it up on one time. Um, while I'm out there, just find the right people and then leave um, without having to keep going back to try to get it figured out. Now that I know how to do it and how to set it up and, you know, it's just a matter of having a system in place. You know, it's, you know, there's a checklist of things she has to do when she goes there to clean, to get the house back in order, um, you know, taking thorough pictures of how maybe you want certain things or things displayed. Um, you know, we kind of have to communicate with her a little bit and let her know like how much toilet paper or paper towels to leave or, you know, how many guests are coming, things like that. So she can prepare it to, you know, for that person. But, um, but how'd yeah. you develop that checklist, James? Is that something you made up yourself? No, um, that guy that I was telling you about that does all the Airbnbs through rentals. Um, you know, I got, I just used his. Okay. Are you, yep. is, it, is it evolving as new ideas or things come up? You're adding new things to it? And yeah. I mean, um, you know, cause mine's a little bit different with the being the lake and stuff like that. Um, you know, so I've been trying to, you know, so, so I have a house manual whenever someone, um, 
is going to check in. It tells, it tells like how to access that. I've got like pictures of the lock and how to operate it. Uh, I just try to make it as dumbed down as possible so that everybody can, you know, get through it. You know, we, we tell the checkout times and check-in times and our, our house rules, like, you know, there's certain things that they can and can't do, you know, make sure the ladder on the dock is up. Don't touch the boats or leave the neighbor stuff alone, you know, keep it down at night, you know, when it's midnight, just things like that, just, you know, rules for them. And if they don't follow them, then, you know, we can ask them to leave. So. Wow. I, I love, I love this idea. It's, it's basically running a hotel Mm -hmm. uh, without the government interference, uh, which is my question. You're, this is in Kansas. This is this probably Missouri. Missouri. Uh, are the, are the politicians and legislators starting to stick their nose into this Airbnb thing? They love to get their hands. They are in Kansas city. Um, but it's not, um, it's not statewide yet. So it's starting to be in certain areas. Mm -hmm. But, um, I know Airbnb, they um, started doing some changes with it too. So like when people book, they actually get taxed on that, um, but it doesn't come to me. So it doesn't affect my income on it. It just affect, it just makes their price higher because they're, they're paying tax. And then uh, Airbnb will pay that tax to the state. I don't know if you're, are you, ta- I see, a, I use Airbnb when I travel. I love, when I go to New York City, I get a, a furnished apartment with a bar and a, and everything, which I love, rather than a, a, ho- a crummy little hotel room for 500 bucks a night. Right. Uh, you know, which is for starters. Do you have to, um, do you attach cleaning fees? I don't know if you mentioned that before. Yep. So we have a $140 cleaning fee. Uh, Whoa. That's, yep. they pay, wow. Is that per night or the whole stay? It's just a stay. Wow. So if, 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 you know, in my house manual says this too, like if it's like crazy dirty, which I haven't had this yet, but if it was, then I would, te- I would charge more. Um, you know, because the thing is, is, you know, she has to basically be there for the turnover. So, you know, I have four, I have five beds in there. So, I mean, we've got to get through all that laundry. We've got to get through all of the towels and stuff that they've done. Um, you know, and then she's just got to try to clean the entire place. Basically, you know, there's, there's six hours between or you know, there's five hours between all of that, you know, so it takes a while to get the laundry done. Um, because, you know, we're, I mean, one thing too, which, you know, was a lesson we had to figure out is, so we were using like actual comforters and then some people were like, you know, don't wash the comforters every time. I'm like, that's disgusting. Like, I don't want to live on that. You know, so um, we ended up having to go with uh, the duvet covers. So it's just like a comforter and then you've got the sheet, like the pillowcase over the comforter. So now it's just basically a sheet we're pulling off. You know what that, you know what those are? Um, Duvet covers? No, I do not. So basically it's like a comforter and usually it's just white, but then you've got like this pillowcase that goes over it. Okay. And it usually has a zipper on the end or buttons. And um, so basically that takes down on the bulkiness of it. And then that allows us to get more laundry done, um, you know, to make it a little bit faster. But yeah, and then she's obviously got to clean the entire house. So I'm fascinated. I'm fascinated by the Midwest. How come the prices are so low for the properties, but the rents are so high? Why? I, I've never understood that. I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's all the Midwest, though. I mean, that, that's how it is. I, can we um, tell me if this is okay? You were talking to me about a deal uh, recently, around twenty five thousand dollars. Can we talk about that for one minute? What the, what kind of rents you get for those properties? Yeah, so I actually just talked to that guy a little bit ago. So I'm getting it for twenty uh, twenty four grand, and um, it's what is rent- that? what is that in California? That's a cardboard box behind the Walmart. What is that? What? Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a two story house. It's like, I mean, it's, it's more of a lower income area. Um, but it's a Hispanic area. There's a Hispanic, uh, couple in there living with their kids and uh, they're paying 700 a month. They've been there for two or three years. They want to buy it, but they, you know, you can't get financing on those things. So I like owner financing to them. So I actually talked to the tenant earlier too. And so he thinks he's going to be able to come up with $10,000 uh, in the next few weeks. So I'm going to close on it for 24, have them put 10,000 down. So I'll be into it for 14. And then he thinks he could pay 750 a month for sure, possibly 800. So 
on that 15 or 14, I'll make 750 to 800 a month cash flow. So literally in 36 months, I just did a few little calculations here. You, that house can be free and clear in 36 months. Actually less because again, I'll only be into it for 14. Well, cause you got the 10 down and then you have that house for the rest of your life, $700 a month. Well, no, I'm going to underfinance it to them. I'm not going to rent it. Okay. But yeah. regard, you're going to but, the bank. Yeah, still. Mm -hmm. yep, I'll sell, I'll sell it to him for 50 grand. Um, and, uh, he'll put 10,000 down his balance will be 40 and then, yeah, he'll do it for however many years. Any interest? Yeah, it'll be close to 10. 10% 10 interest. Okay. Wow. A lot, amazing deal. Uh, we, this went so fast. We've got about 12 minutes left guys. Who has questions? I have a lot, but let, let me let throw this to the audience here. Well, I have a question, I guess, James. I, I'm looking to do uh, more creative real estate deals. I'm in Dallas, a very competitive market right now. Um, and I'd uh, like to know, what's the best way for me to find uh, more creative deals? How are you finding creative real estate deals? Uh, and it really, this is to the group. Uh, I mean, you're just going to find it. I don't think there's a way to find them. It's just a matter of making the offer. <clears throat> So any deal that I come across, you know, I usually make a few different offers. I make a cash offer, I make an owner finance offer, and I make a lease option offer. And I make it on every single deal. I don't care how far apart we are. If they're like, hey, my bottom dollar is this on the phone, I'm still going to make the offer. And then I usually send a letter of intent uh, with those three options on it. I'll email it uh, to them so that they at least have a copy. And I can share this with everybody, but I've got a letter of intent that basically is a letter that has the options, but then it also kind of leaves it open for more negotiation. So it's kind of like, hey, circle the one that works best for you. Or if, if you don't like any of them, circle the one that's closest and, and edit it and tell me what your offer would be. But at least it allows them to kind of renegotiate and it's not just a closed off deal. It's not, hey, I can only offer this much. Oh, it doesn't work. Okay, I'll follow up with you. you, know, how, do you send that, how do you send that, James? Email? Yeah, I, I email them. Okay. I love that you make proactive offers and you give multiple choice. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's great. Go, uh, Chris, you want to follow up or? Uh, yeah, no, um, not really. I mean, I guess that question is to the group. Maybe everybody could help me uh, at, uh, try to, uh, I'm just trying to increase my deal flow with the creative deals. I do a lot of wholesaling, but uh, haven't got many uh, owner finance deals or, or uh, you know, lease purchase deals. And I like to do more. Okay. So, so on all the leads that you're doing, how many of them are you off, are you making a um, creative offer on? All of them. I do the same thing. Basically, I send out a letter of intent with several options on it, and I, I, I send out deep discounted cash offers to make my owner finance offer look more, you know, uh, better for the seller. But uh, I'm still not getting any. I, I don't know. It's a seller's market. It's very competitive. You know, maybe uh, that may be it, or or uh, some other things I'm not paying attention to. I, I mean, I've overpaid for properties as long as the terms are good. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't really care what they, what the price is, you know, as long as the terms are good, who cares? You yeah. know, yeah. If they're going to finance it long enough or if the payment and the cash flow is, you know, if there's enough, enough there. I mean, I'll overpay on a property if, um, if I get, if I can get the interest very low or a hundred percent of the payment towards the principal. Yep. Uh, you know, if you ever studied amortization schedules, you understand why banks have the bill, uh, biggest buildings in cities. Mm. Okay. They're not, they're making several times what the cost of the loan is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Who has a question? Uh, anyone else have a question for James here? You got a wealth of information from a real live investor here. There go those crickets again. <laughs> My in-laws did. Um, I have a question too. Go ahead. You go. Yes. Uh, so my question would be, uh, since I'm in California, let's say I wanted to invest in the Midwest, would that be a good idea or not? How would you do the, the, uh, the managing of the properties? Let's say you're doing lease options or you have your own uh, rental properties. Um, I mean, you can find a property manager. Um, I don't really know of any good ones out here for whatever reason. I hate to say that, but uh, um, I don't know what it is about the Kansas City market that doesn't seem to have great uh, management. It's like but, that everywhere, uh, James. Yeah. That's why I asked you about Hawaii. 
uh, you know, you're thousands of miles away. The, the management is the key, uh, but you know how to buy a property, how to negotiate, finance it, lock it up. But the biggest problem to me is always going to be the management. Uh, well, and so I manage all my own properties, um, but I only have a few of them that are even rentals. So the ones that are renting, um, you know, I do them through like, uh, not section eight, but just a housing authority. So there's like the VA and the save Inc out here and there's a few other ones, but I try to do them through there. Cause then there's like a case worker or somebody that's over them as well. Um, that kind of kicks them in the butt and I can kind of hang that over their head and say, Hey, look, you know, you're not doing what you're supposed to do. I need to contact them. It usually straightens them up. Um, but the rest of them, I just, I don't like, I don't like tenants. So, um, you know, I know I'm not going to own those properties forever, but you know, I like to finance them back out to people and primarily Hispanic buyers because they put the house, you know, as their top priority, you know, the house, you know, having a house, their, their family and house is like their main thing, you know? So I've had people that couldn't afford it or not, not couldn't afford it, but maybe they're almost starting to get behind. And it's like, they always have a family member. They always have people they can reach out to, to be able to get that taken care of, or they'll have a family member move in with them. You know, I mean, it, it, I've never had issues with Hispanic buyers or tenants. So, wow. But, I, but to answer your question, just, I mean, I would try to find somebody out here, uh, wherever you're at, um, you know, that's, you know, maybe a smaller, uh, you know, find a handyman. Maybe he's just the one uh, that, uh, you know, is, is kind of overseeing it and then just pay him. And if you're not for sure on that person, I, so have a backup you know, have somebody that checks up on that person. And in that way, you're, you're not getting, you know, oh, hey, this is what's going on. You got somebody who can go double check and make sure and verify that that person is uh, doing, or, you know, saying what they're saying is true, you know, because you don't want them saying, oh, there's, a, there's a, these repairs that are needed and then you're paying money and it's just going in their pocket or something. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Who else has a question for James? Got a few minutes left here. I got a question. Um, yeah. My in-laws, my in my in-laws are doing that. In, uh, the Airbnb, they quartered off one of their rooms. Would you think it might be logical to do that, where you can lease option purchase some of the house to someone and then do part of the house doing that? You understand what I'm saying? Um, you know. I mean, for, I think for someone like, to property manage, like you would talk about property management, having, having some have a problem with property management. So if you lease option part of the house to a certain person, but also use part of the house for the Airbnb process. So they're actually going to watch over it while they're doing a lease option. With you. Would that be something that you would consider doing? I'm not sure that I understand what you're asking. So have a manager oversee the, the room that you're renting out. Yeah. The person you're lease option the house to, like, let's say you're, you're lease optioning a house, but you're going to take one of those rooms and use it as an Air, Airbnb. Have the person you're leasing, doing the lease option with, have them manage the, uh, the room. You know, so, so if you can't find a good property manager, you have the person you're putting in the house manage that room. Right, but when you say lease optioning, are you yeah. saying you're, your tenant buyer? Yes. Okay, so the house that they're buying from you on a lease option, you're going to – you know that they have two rooms out of the three and the, the, the third room you're you're doing an Airbnb and on just have them oversee that that room yes I mean you could definitely do that I mean if they're willing to I mean it comes down to them so like on my triplex um, that I had that I was doing at the beginning of the year and through Christmas um, I had one of my tenants in there that was doing all the, the laundry and stuff for me because that was my very first one, you know, and I was going down there, I was getting it, I was bringing it back. I had three sets of everything. So I would bring that stuff back and I was doing it, which I knew wasn't going to work long term because I wasn't going to keep driving 40 minutes to go get the stuff and then having to take it back. But so I worked something out with my tenant uh, in one of my other units where, you know, I had, cause I already had internet for the uh, unit I was using. So I just gave her access to the internet so she didn't have to pay for it. She was okay with that. I provided the, the detergent and dryer sheets and all that stuff. And I said, hey, you can use this stuff for your stuff as well. 
but I asked her to do it. So my cleaners would put the laundry in the laundry room and then she would just wash it, fold it up, put it in these totes and it'd be ready for my cleaners uh, to, to grab and put it into the unit. So, I mean, you could do it, just make, you know, there probably needs to be some sort of incentive there for that individual. James, we're almost out of time. Um, could you sh really quickly share that one deal you did? You, uh, I love this story. Uh, you did the deal with uh, the owner of the house. He was divorced, but his ex-wife's daughter or something was still living in the house. Could you tell that story real quick? I love that one. Yeah, so. Um, and it was a great deal. It, I think in February, so I had a VA that was making calls for me, a virtual assistant. And um, he had uh, done, was doing some cold calling for me on some, some houses that I skip traced. And uh, he called this person and put it into my CRM and, and I was reviewing it. And I was like asking him, I was like, you put 10,000 in here. I was like, is that what, you know, cause it was a really nice house. And he's like, so I was asking him if it was 10,000 over what they owe. And he's like, I don't think they owe anything. And I was like, what? And so anyways, I called the guy and he was just like, you know, yeah, you know, just I'll sell it to you for what I owe on it or for the back taxes. You pay the closing costs, you can have it. And I'm going, this is too good to be true. <laughs> and so I'm like, something's wrong. The title work's going to be wrong or something. How much was it worth? Um, so it was right around 160. <laughs> and um, so anyways, I went and looked at the house. He's like, yeah, you know, this lady's, uh, you know, whatever. She's crazy, you know, you're, you know, good luck, basically. And uh, so anyways, I went by the house. I knocked on the door and her granddaughter answered it. And, you know, so they were still living at the property. They hadn't been paying anything except for like one of the utilities. I think it was the walk or the electric. And, um, you know, so anyways, I went and talk with her I was able to get the grandma on the phone and she was like you know yeah we're still living here and I was like well you know I'm in the process of buying it she was like oh well you don't want that house like she was trying to talk me out of buying it because probably she was not paying anything so it was free for her but anyways the guy was selling it because um, he owned it he was living there with an ex-wife he got with this lady and um, she moved in and then she, so she was a hoarder just disgusting and um so anyways, he basically just bailed on the house and her and just abandoned it. And she had been living in it for the last like three or four years by herself. And um, so he was just, you know, he'd been paying the insurance on it or not the insurance of taxes, the um, all the utilities for a couple of years. He finally got one out of his name, but he couldn't get the other one <clears throat> because um, he had to come back here and he didn't want to even come back here to, to do it. So, um, so anyways, he's just like, you know, yeah, you you sign, you pay for everything and I'll just sign it over. And I'm just like, I'm, I'm talking to different people. I'm like, no. And I'm like, would you do this? Like part of me was like, don't send a contract that's making it zero for him. Cause I didn't want a, his new wife to like chirp in his ear or somebody and go, you know, Hey, why are you just giving this away for free? You know? So I sent him a contract for $2,000 and he was like, there's 2000 on here. Is that what I'm getting? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, Oh, cool. <laughs> you know, I'm just like <laughs> for $160,000 house. Yeah. So, um, so anyways, I, love, I, I love the these stories. I love these stories. <laughs> <laughs> so I got the house and it caught, it was about $8,000 by the time, or I think it was around six. I paid to about $2,000. I emptied the house out and I filled up four dumpsters, four 40 yard dumpsters, and she still hauled off like a huge U-Haul truck full of stuff. I mean, this lady was a hoarder. There was so much stuff in this house. There was, I mean, I, I, I'll share the pictures here a little bit later. Okay. Um, it's, it's, it's really crazy how bad it was. But, um, yeah, so anyways, I went in there and I rehabbed it. And then, um, so I used That's a hard money. the lady out of the house there, James? How did oh, you yeah. get her out? Oh, yeah, I had to pay her to leave. So that was my, I, I did cash for keys. Um, so I paid her a thousand dollars to leave and move out within a week and, she, and it ended up taking her two weeks, but she still left the house. I mean, she didn't damage it, which is what I cared about. So, um, it took her about two weeks to get out. Um, I gave her a thousand dollars to leave and then, um, I did her, um, I, uh, got a hard money loan on it. And so they gave me 107 grand for it. So they kept 55,000 for the rehab and then paid me the rest. So I, I ended up pulling like profit out like 30 something thousand right at the beginning 
And then I rehabbed it. I had it sold like uh, almost three weeks before I was even done. Um, and then as soon as, um, well, I wasn't even completed yet. I had a, a small punch list, but I closed on it. And then I had some stuff I was doing right after it. Cause I sold it to a big hedge fund out here. that's buying thousands of properties. And, uh, yeah, I sold it for 170,000. So I made a little Woo! over hundred grand on that. How about a round of applause to Mr. Dunwoody here? Do you, you guys like hearing about it, these kind of deals? Aren't they fun? That's why yeah. the calls are so mm -hmm. There's so much opportunity in the phone calls, and we're the first dibs. You know, so we did something like that, too, uh, last year. The lady owed back taxes. Um, whatever the phone call resonated with her, she called me back and said that. And she had a broker, too. Um, but we ended up buying five acres of land for like right around 10 grand and it's worth about 50 right now, just a year. Nice. That's fantastic. Awesome out there. James, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, if anyone wants to get hold of you, uh, do you um, would you like to put your email or phone number or anything like that in the uh, chat box there? Or I can do it for you. Um, yeah, I can. Um, that'd be great. Here, um, you yes. know, once again, we're, uh, you, what you heard from James is, he finds the properties, he finds the problems, he uses guts, he asks the questions, he becomes the doctor of real estate. How do I solve this problem? Uh, and every now and then you get very, you talk to enough people, you get somebody for $2,000, you get a $170,000 property. You know, even a blind old dog can smell up a bone once in a while, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I love hearing about these deals. I think the one thing I take away from James is that you're very creative and you're very consistent. You treat this like a business. You work on it on a on a on a day to day basis, don't you? I do. Yep. Yeah. So this is good. We're way out of time, but man, I could talk to you for hours. I love I love hearing these stories and deals and stuff. They're so creative and everything. So thank you, everybody. We will go over the the new book. Uh, I put it also in the chat box here. You guys get it for free. It's brand, a final edit. Um, I'm gonna print it and do some other things with audio and stuff with it. But I wanted you guys to get it. Uh, today and you also we're going to discuss it next week uh, pick out your three favorite rules and uh, once again thanks to all for joining us today I, have, a, have a great week and a safe summer everybody Claude, i got one thing real quick um so how since this chat will go down should um i think there's a facebook group right do you want me to just put the loi in there and then those pictures oh yeah uh, could you send it to me in skype yeah, just send if it directly send it to, to you. On Skype, uh, we have a, you know we have the special group in Skype. Okay, the Monday VIP group call. Right. If you could just put those pictures in there, that everybody who's in this group will get them. Okay, sounds good. Sounds great. Thanks again, James. Everybody, great yeah. week, safe Thank summer. You. Talk to you later. All right, thanks. Bye. Little Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Little music going out here.